Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. I'm a, kind of like a new grandfather. That's sort of cool. Blaine made us all cry. Okay, great. Well, we're continuing our series in Hebrews. And by the way, um, I don't know if you remember, but we're giving out little um, questions for study. Uh, there should be some copies back there, uh, questions from chapter 9 through 13. Um, next week, I'm going to be doing a sermon uh, called From Shadow to Reality. Uh, that comes from one of the books that I've written. I think that's a, a, actually a fairly good sermon. Uh, you ought to bring your friends along. And that fits in exactly, as you'll see, with the message that we're doing uh, this week. And, and so, there you go. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. The title of my sermon is The Main Point. All right? Now, every time anybody preaches a sermon, they say the main point is the thing we're talking about. This is the most important, right now, this is the most important thing. So everybody says that. But in my opinion, this is the main point of Hebrews. Let me read Hebrews 8 1 to justify my opinion. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Verse 2. And who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So, see what I, see what I said? I mean, honestly, this is the main point. And, and what is the main point? What's the main point of Hebrews? No, that's Romans. The main point of Romans is faith. Right. We have a great... Thank you. Whenever you're asked a question about a verse in the Bible, you know what you should do? Look at the verse in the Bible, which is exactly what Lisa did. She gets an A. The main point is we have an incredible, amazing high priest. A priest in the order of who? Who? Melchizedek. Remember that last week? Melchizedek, a greater high priest. Uh, Abraham gave an offering to him. He gave a tithe to him. Jesus serves in the true tabernacle. We have a high priest who sat at the right hand of the throne of God. The priests never sat down in the tabernacle. There were no chairs. And the tabernacle. Well, there was the mercy seat. Can you imagine a priest getting up and sitting on the mercy seat? I don't think so. That's, that's, that's a really bad idea. There were no seats. But we learned last week that Jesus is a royal priest. They didn't have royal priests in Israel. The kings came from Judah. The priests came from Levi. Jesus, what's he doing in this tabernacle? He's serving. That's what he's doing. He is, who's he serving? He's serving God, but he's serving us. That is the high priest we have. King Jesus is sitting in the real heavenly tabernacle. Now let's read, I'm going to read uh, through verse 5. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. <clears throat> if we were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when it was, it was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. All right. So, it says here that every high priest brings gifts and sacrifices. All right, so, what's the difference between a gift and a sacrifice? Well, in the Jewish system, they had gifts and they had sacrifices. The gifts 
We're different from the sacrifices. We, 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 in our Romans class yesterday, we studied about this. We, we learned, you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's sort of an oxymoron, isn't it? A living, it's like a jumbo shrimp, you know, jumbo shrimp. It's an oxymoron. All right, a living sacrifice, if you got sacrificed, you're dead, right? But see, let's talk about the burnt offering. And really, the, offer, the burnt offering isn't a sacrifice, it's a gift. So priests offered gifts and sacrifices. And the gifts, they smelled good. They were a sweet aroma. In Leviticus 1, you can read about, about the, the burnt offering, how it was a sweet aroma. And in Ephesians 1, it talks about that Jesus gave his life as an offering. You know, Jesus gave his death as an offering. And he gave his life as an offering. All right, we don't give our death as an offering, right? Uh, our, death, our death really wouldn't really save anybody, right? But we give our life as an offering. So priests offer gifts and sacrifices. But he said, Jesus, he's not going to the temple to offer gifts and sacrifices. The reason he's not going to the temple to offer gifts and sacrifices is because there's priests already doing that. They're taking care of that. But he says that they offer gifts and sacrifice at a sanctuary that is just a copy and a shadow. A uh, copy. I love that. I, I'm not really into using Greek words too often. I'm going to use more Greek words in this lesson than any ten combined normally. But I really, this is a really awesome word. Hupo deigma. I mean, let, let's just say that together. Hupo deigma. I mean, that, that, I have no idea how to pronounce it, by the way. I don't speak Greek. All right, we're just guessing. A hupo deigma. And again, I think I used the illustration earlier. It's like, remember when you were a kid, you made a diorama. Remember you got the little shoe box? Young people you didn't, but old people, old people. By the way, believe it or not, he's 50 years old. He looks like, he looks like 38, right? He's, the guy is 50 years old. I mean, he is the father to Joel, who's 22. So honestly, he's 50. So he can remember. So maybe you got the little uh, little shoebox thing, and and you you put the, you tape little pictures in the back. You put the little things there. It, it's a scale model. He says Judaism. It's like a scale model. I needed some help here, so Darius offered. Here, here we go. All right, this is a scale model, and it's sort of cool. It even has a little picture of the drivetrain on the bottom. You know, uh, you want to get in and drive this thing? <laughs> See, this is what religion is like. Religion is like this car. I mean, it's a nice car. It's a great little car. All right. But uh, you, it doesn't take you anywhere. The engine, it's fake. It looks good. It's shiny. It's got a nice, nice color scheme on there. Little, little racing stripe there. It's not the real thing. So my question is, which kind of Christianity do you have? This kind? Or the actual kind. What kind of car is this? A Dodge Charger or something like that? I don't know. Oh, it's a Skyline. I don't know what a Skyline is. It's a pretty awesome car, I guess. Yeah, in fact, you know, I think I used this uh, illustration before. But if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to the Jerusalem Museum, there's a great scale model of the city. All right, and that's an actual picture of it. You can see the guys kind of walking around. It's a, it's a 50 to 1 scale model. So, you know, the temple's like, I don't know, a thousand feet long. So it's this thing, you know, it's 20 feet on the side. That thing there is pretty big. All right, imagine flying all the way to Jerusalem and just visiting the scale model. How foolish would that be? But I think some of us settle for Christianity that's kind of like that. You know, we're, we're just kind of into religion. And see, that, that's what the Jews were tempted to do. The Jews were tempted to abandon real Christianity. You know, the kind where you give up everything you have and follow Jesus. You, you, you offer your bodies, Romans 12, 1 and 2, as living sacrifices, acceptable and pleasing to God. And they were, just wanted to go to church and have nice little ceremonies, nice safe little ceremonies. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, God bless you. Christianity. Uh, Colossians 2.17. Let's, let's look there. Colossians 2.17. 
I want you to take some time to think about what kind of Christianity you have been doing. Is it scale, model, hupo, deigba? Christianity? Colossians 2, 17. He's talking about the religious festivals, the new moon celebrations, the Sabbaths, those things. He says, these are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality is found in Christ. So he says, the tabernacle, the one that the Jews worshipped at, the ones that the Levites and the priests of Aaron uh, gave gifts and offering, he says, it's like, it's like a... It's like a diorama, a little scale model. It's kind of like a shadow. All right? and, and imagine if the real thing is there, that you talk to the shadow. So imagine I, I kind of walk up to the shadow. I say, can I shake your hand? And Well, you're, you're looking kind of flat. You know, you're, it's, it's kind of, one, kind of two-dimensional there. All right? That's the kind of Christianity... I'm afraid it's fairly common, and I hope it's not common in this room, where you have a five-minute prayer, you just kind of go through your little ceremony, but you don't really give your heart to God. All right? And um, so I, I, I really think that we need to be challenged by Hebrews 8. Let's go back to Hebrews 8. Is, do you have a scale model Christianity? You're just doing the religious thing. You're showing up because you're supposed to. Or is your heart there? He says, the, the Old Testament, the, it was, it was a, a scale model, a copy, and a shadow. A shadow is like a reflection. Shadows don't have much definition. There's just not much there. Not much to chew on. So again, is your Christianity a shadow? Or is it a reality? In Hebrews 10, verse 1, let's go there very quickly. Same kind of idea. The law, in other words, uh, righteousness through works, through doing stuff, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. Where is the reality found? It's found in Christ. That's where the reality is found. So why look at the shadow? Now let's go back. Uh, let's read verse 6. We're going to read chapter 8, verse 6, all the way down to verse uh, 12. So the main topic of Hebrews chapter 8 is about the new covenant. And like I said, we're going to kind of get into a little bit of Greek stuff here. So we're going to talk about the word new, and we're going to talk about the word covenant. All right? So let's read Hebrews 8, 6 through 12. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs. Christianity is as superior to religion. Got it? As um, the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, Now, did find, who did God find fault with? The people. Not with the covenant. The covenant wasn't the problem, right? The covenant says, do these things you knew will live. All right? The problem lay with the people because they didn't do those things. God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Uh, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. Uh, and, I, and I turned away from their, them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Now, so he's talking about this covenant and he's also talking about a pattern. It's kind of interesting. 
there's this thing he made. Let's go back, let, let me go back to verse 5. I skip one little point I want to make there. At the end of verse 5, he said, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. Now, what he's talking to about is, is basically when he told Moses to build the tabernacle. He says, make the tabernacle exactly, exactly according to the instructions I gave you. And, and he is very serious about this. What's the big deal? Uh, what's the big deal about doing it exactly according to the pattern? It's about the holiness of God. Because God is perfect. All right, let's, um, let's go to Ezekiel 43, verse 10 and 11. Ezekiel 43, verse 10 and 11. I think I might have already mentioned that Ezekiel 40 through 46 is the most boring part of the Bible. Have you ever read it? I mean, I could just pick up anywhere in the middle. All right, I'll go uh, verse 42. The main, uh, uh, let me see. The building whose door faced north was 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide, both in the section of 20 cubits from the inner court, in the section opposite the pavement of the outer court, the gallery faced the gallery at the three levels, in front of the rooms. I mean, are you falling asleep yet or not? All right, great. I mean, and he goes on and on and on and on and on. He specifies, like, you know, it's like pe when people are building a new house and they spend years, they're going to get the right trim and the right, the, the, the little knobs on the door. I mean, why do people care about it? I don't know, but they apparently care about that stuff. What's going on here? Well, let's read 43, verse 10 and 11. Son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel that they may be shamed of their sins. Let them consider its perfection. And if they're ashamed of all they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement, its exits, and its entrances. You know, I, I see the look on Sean's face. What's, what's, what does the dimensions of the temple do is going to make them feel ashamed of their sins? I mean, how could a bunch of numbers and distances and measurements, it's about God's perfection. I mean, God is perfect, and in case you didn't know it, you're not, okay? In fact, we ain't even close. So that's why God said to build the temple exactly the way I said. Because who's going to live in that temple? God is going to live in that temple. But what else does God live in? He lives in us. The God of heaven who only lives in a perfect temple. He comes and he lives in us. That's crazy. That's crazy stuff. It's amazing. You know what? Let's keep that temple as close to perfect as we possibly can. And let's be ashamed of our sin. Now, luckily, in Hebrews chapter 9, we learned that through Jesus, we don't have to feel guilty. You know, it, you know what? You can feel ashamed without feeling guilty. All right, let me say that again. You can feel ashamed without feeling guilty. What I mean by that is you can feel like, I don't want to do that. I want to be a holy temple. But praise God, I'm forgiven. All right, you got that? That's the way it works. So next time you're reading Ezekiel 40 through 46, you'll probably fall asleep again anyway, because let's be honest, even if you know that it's important, you're still going to fall asleep. But now you know why. Now you know why God goes into incredibly ridiculous detail about the temple, because he's going to live in that temple. And if God is going to live in you, I hope you're motivated to keep that temple clean. So I'm glad I didn't forget that and went back and read that verse. 
because that's a big point. There's, I mean, God's word is so amazing because every little tiny word, every little phrase has deep meaning, and we just got to be able to kind of pull it out. By the way, um, I lost uh, verse uh, chapter 3 through 7, but I have chapter 8 in my Bible, so I'm back to using my Bible. I'm really glad about that. All right, so anyway, great. So what is a covenant? We have this new covenant. There was a problem with the old covenant, and therefore God gave us a new covenant. Just like there was a problem with the old priesthood, so God gave us a new priesthood. And just like there was a problem with the old sacrifices, so God gave us a new sacrifice. And what is a covenant? Well, it turns out in Greek, there's two words for covenant. There's sunthiki and diathiki. And again, I have no idea if that's how you pronounce it. That's just my best guess there. All right, and now, a, a, a covenant is an agreement. It's like a contract. Okay, that's what a covenant is. The general meaning of the word covenant is like a contract, but it's a solemn contract, correct? Uh, basically, a covenant is you basically sort of saying, I swear, you know, my, on my life, I swear. That's what a covenant is. As a, so, but a sunthiki, which is the normal Use word. So in Greek, if you were to read, if you were to translate from Greek to English, the word covenant, 90% of the time it'd be santhiki. But there's this special word used very, very rarely, and it's a diathiki, which is a contractual agreement between a superior and a lesser party, authored solely by the superior. It's like a will. All right? So the new covenant is not a santhiki. Which is like, hey, let's sit down and have a little negotiation. All right, you give me this, I give you that. It, it's not like that. It's like, God says, this is it. All right? It's kind of like when the Japanese and the Americans sat down after World War II, they weren't having a negotiation, were they? There was, no, there was not a whole lot of negotiating going on. They said, all right, here are the terms. All right? And, and so that's the covenant we have. It's, it's a will. And later on in... Uh, chapter 9, he says, in order for a will to come into effect, what is required for a will to come into effect normally? The person has to die. And so he says, the covenant we have, it, it, it is like a diathiki. All right, in verse 6, it says, but in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received is superior to theirs, as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. So who's the mediator of this covenant? Jesus is the mediator. The word is mesites, which means the go-between, the peacemaker, the reconciler. And then he's going to talk about what is great about this covenant we have. It's, he says the ministry that Jesus received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one. He says it's a new. Now, there's two words for new in the Greek. There's neos which means, you, you, you can see where the word new comes from, neos. Neos means a new one. All right, so for example, if you buy a car and it you know, gets destroyed, you buy a new car. Okay? And then there's kainos, which means a totally new thing. In other words, something that's never happened before. All right, so for example... When man went to the moon, that was a new thing. That was a new thing. This is a completely, utterly new covenant. And then what he does is he goes to Jeremiah 31. He quotes directly from Jeremiah 31 to tell us some things about this covenant. All right? So let's look at some of the things that are, are, are better about this covenant. First of all, in verse 6, it's based on better promises. Now, in chapter 9, we're going to learn about some of the better promises that we have in the New Covenant. Uh, in uh, verse 9, it says, uh, well, it's based on the righteousness of Jesus. Let's, let's go to verse 9. Uh, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. I turned away from them, declares the Lord. So the old covenant was based on the people's faithfulness. And how do they do? And not so good. 
the new covenant is based on Jesus' faithfulness. That's a much better basis for a covenant. Okay, uh, let me see. In verse 10, it says, This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put their laws, put my laws in their minds. I'll write them on their hearts. I'll be their God and they will be my people. So in this new covenant, uh, the service is because we want to instead of because we have to. The old covenant, it was obligation. The old covenant was law. And that obligation, Colossians 2, verse 15 through 17, was nailed to the cross. So the new covenant is because we want to. It's, because, it's out of love. It's service because we want to lay our lives down. Uh, in fact, in the Old Testament, the burnt offering was a voluntary offering. You don't have to do it. I mentioned that in the Romans class yesterday. What God is calling us to do, which is to make our lives a living sacrifice, that's something we choose to do. You know, it's not like if you make more offering to God, you're more saved. It doesn't work that way. All right, so if you're going to live this real, not scale model Christianity, all right, you do that because you want to. That's where the blessing comes from. Uh, also, um, it's a personal, intimate relationship. Uh, no longer will they teach their neighbors, say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I'll remember their sins no more. See, this new covenant, it's about an intimate relationship. Did the Jews have an intimate relationship with God? Well, we're going to see... <laughs> Uh, in the first part of chapter 9, uh, it, it just wasn't like that. Through Christ, we have access. The, the curtain has been torn in two. There's no separation between the altar of incense and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. It's, it's a personal relationship. Not one mediated by a human. It's one mediated by God himself. And God says, I will remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 is another beautiful description of the covenant that we have. The covenant was prophesied in Jeremiah 31. And it's also prophesied in, in Ezekiel 36. Let's read about this amazing, new, brand new, not Neos, Kainos, totally new covenant, of which there was no similar covenant ever. Uh, Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. So I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities and from all your idols I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's the covenant we have in Christ. Our mediator. There's one mediator between man and God. The man Jesus Christ. What a great covenant we have. I got a little summary of the, of the uh, differences in the covenants here. All right, great. So in the old covenant, you had obedience to physically defined rules required. In the new covenant, it's obedience to spiritual principles. Rather than rules, principles. Which is better, rules or principles? There's a lot of freedom in that. In the Old Covenant, there's physical blessings like, you know, fields and lands and children and sheep and crops. In the New Testament, we have spiritual blessings like salvation, like freedom from guilt, like saving people and getting to go to heaven and knowing God on a personal basis. In the Old Covenant, it was ceremonial cleanness. In other words, the outside was clean. In the New Covenant, as we're going to see in chapter 9, real forgiveness, freedom from guilt. And the, the Old Covenant, 
the sacrifices bridges the chasm between law and effort. Well, in the New Covenant, it's the same thing. The Old Covenant, it was sealed with the blood of bulls and goats. All right, bulls and goats, they're pretty good. The New Covenant was sealed by the blood of Jesus. Much better. Mediated by a high priest, Old Covenant. Mediated by the high priest. And isn't that the main point? The greatness of Christ's high priest. The Old Covenant, laws, rules, and regulations, principles, tithing, giving sacrificially. Which is better? You give exactly how much they say? Or you give exactly how much you want? Okay? Now, under that system of freedom, are you doing better or worse than 10%? Because if we have a better covenant, shouldn't it produce better results? So let me ask you, simple question, not hard to figure out. Before taxes or after taxes? Seriously. Are you asking, you know, I'm not accusing anybody of asking that question. Okay. By the way, this is not a law. You don't have to, right? You don't have to present your body as a living sacrifice in order to be saved. Right? That's something he's asking us to do because we want to. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking. It's a fair question, isn't it? Okay. 10%. Give sacrificially. How's it going? Okay. Sabbath. Eternal rest with God. Death. Life. Much better covenant. That's what we have in Jesus. Remember, what we're doing here is, in the book of Hebrews, we're looking at Jesus. And then, we're going to call you to do something, but that's in chapter 10. We're not there yet. So right now, we're mainly getting encouraged. You're getting challenged a little bit. I think that was a little challenge back there. Okay, but we're mainly looking at Jesus. You know, I would say, given the facts, I mean, we're just describing some facts here. You know, uh, freedom, uh, do it because you want to, a more perfect media, all these things. Given the facts, you'd think no sane person would go back to just being religious. Given the facts about Jesus, why would anybody settle for just being religious? But that's what almost everybody does, right? They settle for just being religious. Go into the, the God show on Sunday and you praise the Lord, hallelujah, and live in my life pretty much almost exactly the same. Could we be tempted to do the same? Yes, of course we could. Let's go back to he Hebrews 8. We're going to finish out the chapter. I'm actually going to start chapter 9. We kind of just get started on it. We definitely will not even come close to finishing it. All right, so to summarize this section, we have an amazing new covenant. It says it's based on better promises. This amazing new covenant we have. Verse 13, by calling this covenant new, I know, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. You know what? That's exactly what happened. We don't know when Hebrews was written. It almost certainly was written after 60 A.D. Probably was written after 65 A.D. And certainly was written before 70 A.D. Because when you read Hebrews, you can tell the temple still existed if you read the book. So in other words, let's just say it was written around 67, 68, 69 B.C. You know what happened in 69, sorry, A.D., sorry, A.D., right? After Christ, yeah, okay. So in 69, uh, Vespasian and the, the Roman troops surrounded the city. In fact, it is possible that when Hebrews was written, the city of Jerusalem had already been surrounded by the armies of Rome. Old and fading, and will soon disappear. Within maybe just a few months, or at most within a few years of this Hebrews 8.13 being written, the temple was leveled. And it hasn't been rebuilt. I'm telling you right now, it ain't getting rebuilt. You go to Jerusalem, you think you're going to convince the Muslims to take the, the Dome of the Rock off that mountain? Ah, that's not happening. I'm telling you, if you try to take that thing off the mountain, I know a lot of Christians think that there's going to be the new temple built in Jerusalem. <laughs> that's politics, but I'm telling you, it ain't happening. No, it, it, it was old and fading, and it soon disappeared. And, you know, just 
Religion is old and fading and useless. What we want to have is true Christianity. We want to have a relationship with God. Let me read Hebrews uh, 9, 1 through 11. We'll just kind of get started on chapter 9. Great. All right, so Hebrews 8 is about the new covenant, and Hebrews 9, 1 through 11 is about a new sanctuary. All right, Hebrews 7, new priesthood. Hebrews 8, new covenant. Hebrews 9, 1 through 11, new tabernacle. Hebrews 9, 12 through chapter 10, new sacrifices. All right, that's the idea. So let's read about this new tabernacle. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense and the golden gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover, also called the mercy seat. I made a joke about sitting on that seat. That's a bad joke. I made a bad joke on purpose. All right. Uh, okay. Um, but we cannot discuss these things in detail. All right. Because the sermon has to end in 10 minutes. So we can't go into this. All right. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room. And that only once a year. And never without blood which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed, as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. Now, when this letter was written, was the old sanctuary still functioning? Uh, kind of yes and kind of no. They were actually still doing ceremonies. But remember, when Jesus died, the curtain was ripped in two and, the, and God left the temple. So it's just a shadow, a shell, like he just said at 813. All right, reading on. Uh, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Now, what was the purpose of the tabernacle? All right, where is the tabernacle? There it is. Oops. What happened? Oh, it goes on a loop. Okay, great. There's a picture of the tabernacle. The purpose of the tabernacle is found in Exodus 25, verse 8. The reason the tabernacle was built so that God says, so that I could dwell in your midst. So the purpose of the tabernacle is for God to dwell among his people. Now, the rules for building the tabernacle are found in Exodus 25 through 31. And then 35 through 40. It's like 10 chapters long. Remember, God said to Moses to build it exactly the way I said it. Again, that's not quite as boring as Ezekiel uh, 40 through 46, but it's pretty close. A lot of stuff. You know, in John 1.14, it said Jesus came and dwelt for a while among us, right? It says the word became flesh and lived among us. The actual word is tabernacled. In John 1.14, it says God came and he tabernacled among us. That's a beautiful thought. And Jesus said, you know what? I need to go away because when I come, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's, going, he's been with you, but he said he will be in you. We are the tabernacle. Now, what's the tabernacle about? 
It's about God dwelling among his people. But you know what? This tabernacle had a little bit of a problem. For example, if you go to the temple in Jerusalem, there was the outer, outer court. Only the Gentiles could go into the outer court. And then inside of that, you had the court of the women. And only the women, Jews, could enter the court of women. I guess the men felt superior to the women. I don't think God was behind that system, honestly. I don't think there's any difference. But that's what the Jews came up with. And so the men would strut through the court of the women. And they would go into the, 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 up to the gate. So the males in the tabernacle system would come up to this area here. So in the, in the, uh, in the uh, temple in Jerusalem, there was the outer gate and then the other gate, and then the other gate, and then there was this gate, and then only the Levites could go in here, and then only the priests could go in there, and only the high priests could go There's like six layers of separation. Is that an intimate rep uh, relationship? No. no. And did the Jews want to hang out in there? Are you kidding? I think I told you a few weeks about, the, you know, when the high priest went in there, they tied a rope around his ankle. Separation. The old covenant was a reminder of our separation. Right? Hebrews, um, Romans 7, 17. It, basically, all the old covenant did was made sin utterly sinful. Well, thank you very much. It was just a preparation. But it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I'm sure if you went into the holy place, which, by the way, you wouldn't do. They'd kill you. But, uh, you know, if you did, there was a gold and, you know, the, the incense and the, the beautiful smells. It's beautiful. Every solid gold and all that sort of stuff. But I'm telling you, that's what religion is like. It's just shiny, shiny coin. Oh, beautiful coin. Yeah, but it's empty. We have access through Jesus, through real Christianity, through discipleship, through knowing God. So they had, uh, on the north side, they had, on the north side, they had the, the, the bread, which is a symbol of Jesus. On the south side, they had the, uh, the, the menorah, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And then you had this curtain of separation. Behind that, the Father, Father, Son, Spirit, all this amazing stuff. He says, but you know what? I don't have time to talk about that. It's just an illustration. All right? Um, it, all this uh, represents the separation, not the access that we have. It's been said that the curtain in the temple was a physical parable of the present crisis. The curtain, which had cherubim sewn into the curtain. Uh, by the way, cherubim are not happy angels with uh, harps and, and wings, you know. They're fierce creatures protecting the holiness of God. All right, I think I need to end there. Oh, I'm, I'm about to get to the good news about the fact that we have freedom from guilt, that we, that we have access, the awesome things we have in this well, let me do this. Let me just show you one more thing. I'll just show you some of the, pra the, the parallels. So, in the Old Testament, you had a tabernacle, which was God dwelling in his people, all right? And, the, and the, the equivalent to that is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. You had the bronze altar, which was the altar of sacrifice. We have the sacrifice of Jesus. You have the laver, which gave access to the holy place. We have baptism. You have the bread on the right. Jesus is the bread of life. You have the lampstand on the left, which represents the Holy Spirit. You can read about that in Zechariah 4. You have the altar of incense, which represents the prayers. You have the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn representing the heavens, the kingship of God, the blood of Jesus. The curtain, which represents separation from God, which has been removed. You have the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's presence among the people. You have the mercy seat, which represents the grace of God. The cherubim, which represents the angels in heaven. It's a beautiful picture. But folks, it says in Hebrews 10, 19, we walk boldly into the real tabernacle. This is just a picture. It's just a scale model. 
It's just the shadow. Through Jesus, we have access. So my question to you is this. Are you going to go for religion? Are you going to go for Christianity? Are you going to give your life? Are you going to make your life a living sacrifice? Let us be encouraged by the new covenant and by the new tabernacle we have in Jesus. Thank you very much.